So, I'm not the biggest fan of horror movies. I used to be heavily into independent horror films when I was in high school, but then something changed. It's hard to say for certain when that was, but I think it began around the time that I started acknowledging the trauma and mental illness that I was dealing with. Horror as a genre became less entertaining and more so just a reminder of terrifying things. To see people consciously create gratuitous gore and terror lost its appeal for me, and I haven't really looked back. Even this week I had trouble finishing a video of Drag Queen Trixie Mattel and Katya watching horror films, because the clips shown made me too anxious. Though I thought I could watch Trixie and Katya talk about literally anything, not even their eccentric comedy could make horror palatable for me. But in a way, I'm also really interested in why I'm disturbed so easily. Because there are things that fall under horror, and then there are things that are just spooky. During the Halloween season, it's interesting to see how these different aesthetics interact with each other. Though dancing skeletons might be a grim reminder of death for some, they don't scare me like a murderer chasing someone down a hall does. There's a type of absurd melodrama that makes the former palatable just based on how unrealistic it is. When I see cartoonish werewolves and mummies, I never get genuine anxiety. This type of absurdity and melodrama also makes Halloween distinctly queer for many LGBTQ people. Even just aside from the fact that many LGBTQ people dress in drag and other types of queer costumes for the first time on Halloween, the general aesthetic of the holiday intersects with many aspects of queer culture. As a young LGBTQ person trying to figure out my identity and understand myself, I I always found solace in having one time of the year where I could dress up as whatever I wanted, wear whatever makeup I wanted, and not feel scrutinized by others. Add on to that the more complicated history of queerness and horror and other media techniques like queer coding, and it's no surprise to me that queer people develop unique relationships to monsters, horror, and villains. For example, the legacy of queer-coded villains in Disney movies might be the result of prejudice towards LGBTQ people and associated stereotypes, but at the same time, queer people also have empathy for those villains because while growing up, that was the only type of LGBTQ representation they had. Though I've spoken about Disney and queer-coding before on this channel, there's one movie I haven't addressed that I can't get out of my head whenever spooky season rolls around, and it just so happens to be one of the most uniquely queer entries in the Disney catalog. Let's talk about Hocus Pocus. One, two, be three, to be on the move, to go for a hike or whatever you like to do. On July 13, 1993, Disney released the movie Hocus Pocus. Focusing on the story of children in Salem, Massachusetts, the movie follows the main characters as they try to stop recently resurrected witches from killing the townsfolk before sunrise. The plot of the movie might sound grim, but the overall tone is actually quite lighthearted. The stakes are high, but the story is also just so absurd. For example, one of the funniest parts about the movie is the juxtaposition of the witches and the celebration of Halloween that creates an overarching sense of culture shock throughout. This not only allows the witches to blend in and stick out like sore thumbs at a local dance, but it's also just silly, and it's just overwhelmingly what makes this movie less horror-oriented and more spooky for me. Despite the fact that Hocus Pocus is now regarded as a Halloween classic, it wasn't always that way. In fact, it was originally considered a subpar Halloween film that lost Disney a lot of money with its initial theatrical run. Despite that, over the years it has been picked up as a cult classic, and it's now regarded as one of the most iconic, spooky Disney films ever made. However, as you probably know given that you've clicked on this video, the movie Hocus Pocus has also gained notoriety for being one of the most queer movies that Disney has ever released. Dressing up as the Sanderson sisters is a common Halloween costume nowadays, but it's also notable for being common within drag communities around the world who have embraced the aesthetic of the movie. This relationship to drag isn't just the result of people reading too far into the material, though. In fact, the director Kenny Ortega has shared that there's a deliberate queerness within his work. In an interview with Variety, he shared that the fun of Hocus Pocus is, I mean, the girls are almost drag queens. I pushed for them to go there and kind of felt that we have an audience if they did, and God knows we did. They're beloved characters and emulated all the time. Every Halloween, they're knocking on my door. Those Sanderson sisters are back. There's just kind of a spirit and a fun that is representative of my own spirit and fun that lives under some of my work. And that makes it, I think, queer friendly, if that's a good way to put it. And I think there has been so much progress that you can actually say that now and people won't freak out. As for if there's a sense of queerness running throughout all of his work, Ortega, a gay man, said that, yeah, for sure. I do think that because that's who I am. I put a lot of who I am into my work. 
I mean really all the way back from the earliest work that I've done, even as a choreographer in film and television. And I think, yeah, that it's just there. And whether it's screaming at you or whether it's just sort of quietly there, it's there. So this interview brought us something unique. Though there are quite a few Disney movies and characters that have resonated with the LGBTQ community, it's rare to see someone who worked on a film specifically address those connections. Kenny Ortega directly addressing and confirming these associations feels like a validation of the general instinct that LGBTQ people sometimes feel when relating to Disney media. It seems like there might be something there, but it's mostly subtext. Something else to consider when viewing Hocus Pocus as a queer film is also the casting. Bette Midler basically steals the show as Winifred, setting both the tone and aesthetic of the film. This only helps Ortega's aforementioned queer aesthetic, due to the fact that Midler on her own is already considered a gay icon by many. So the most notable actor from the film is a gay icon, and the director is a gay man who explicitly associates the witches in the movie as being almost drag queens. The intent is there, but what does it mean? How do the witches embody what it means to be a drag queen? Well, the first thing to clarify is what we mean when we say drag. Many people associate drag with cis people impersonating other genders. Though there are historical examples of this, it isn't necessarily what drag culture represents. Instead of being focused on impersonation, drag is an art form of its own that explores the performative nature of gender and allows performers to experiment with their gender expression. To learn more about drag aesthetics, I spoke with Yoni Carmona, a college professor, influencer, real-life Disney princess, and judge on the reality TV drag show La Más Draga. Well, the thing is, certainly drag started a long time ago with theater and art and representation. I think there's one part and then the other part is this modern idea of, of drag thanks to RuPaul's Drag Race that made it globally and inspired a lot of spin-offs and franchise and even inspired the show that I'm in. This new modern take on drag is to represent, exaggerate, take. Because gender now we know it's a construction, a cultural social context what's female what's male it's perceptions and time and accessories and stuff so now we know that not only cis gay men are the ones that are doing drag for example in our show we already have a queen the season winner is a cisgender woman doing drag so it's all about play with these elements of makeup and glitter and fabric and concepts. I think drag now, more than ever, it's a way to create art. It's for everybody. So I think cis women can make drag, trans women can make drag, trans men, cis men, non-binary people. So any gender can partake in or be represented by drag. So how do the Sanderson sisters fit in with this? Their appearances do fall under the definition of drag, with exaggerated looks that are just as grandiose and elegant as they are tacky. To summarize, a lot of drag aesthetics can be classified under something called camp. Camp is complicated to describe, but Susan Sontag summarized aspects of it in her 1964 essay Notes on Camp. The ultimate camp statement, it's good because it's awful. I think a good example of this in Hocus Pocus is the scene where the witches sing the Screamin' Jay Hawkins song, I Put a Spell on You. In a sea of absurd Halloween costumes, the witches both stand out and blend in. Their outfits are over the top and absurd like costumes usually are, but they're also confident and elegant in a way that makes the whole aesthetic feel incredibly camp. Like many drag performers, the witches are using makeup and costumes in a way that feels like a caricature of gender, and the overall approach seems less like something that you would wear casually and more like an artistic statement or something made for performance. Also, I think Hocus Pocus has the drag validation because now it's one of the biggest costumes for drag queens in Halloween. Mm -hmm. So I have our queen of the first season of La Más Draga, Deborah La Grande. She loves to impersonate Beth Midler's witch character. Mm -hmm. She loves it. And every drag group try to mimic and make an homage to that in some point of their career. So I think now, going back to 93, this phenomenon, this last 10 years, validates the drag code to the 93 movie, I think. Not all characters has this drag fascination. Not all characters of Disney movies or 
and other fantastic movies has this fascination. It's, I don't know, it's a combination of, of makeup or fabric and aesthetics and mimics. I don't know, it's a lot of things, but it's not all the time. Aside from their clothing, the way they deliver their lines and interact with other characters in the movie directly plays into both the aforementioned camp and drag queen aesthetics. And since this is a video I'm making about queerness in Disney, I think it's important to reiterate what I'm talking about and what I'm not. When speaking about queerness in media, my goal isn't to say that this is objectively the way that Hocus Pocus must be read, or even that it's a story about queerness. However, what I am saying is that it's another step in a long history of Disney borrowing aspects of LGBTQ culture and associated stereotypes to create characters. And when you have an openly gay director admitting that there is an inherent queerness to his work and that he even referred to the witches as almost drag queens, this association becomes even more interesting. I've spoken in the past about how queer-coded Disney villains have perpetuated stereotypes about how queer people behave, act, and in some cases are a threat to heteronormative society. However, I think Hocus Pocus is a great example of how many people have felt empowered by the notion of queer-coded villains. Like I said, this film was released in 1993. It's important to remember that at the time there certainly weren't large amounts of proper representation in the Disney canon, if any at all. So it's interesting to see how queer people, myself included, have seen ourselves in these characters, almost in a way that distorts the story. For example, well, when I think of Hocus Pocus and what is so great about it, I think about the Sanderson sisters. When I watch them sing I Put a Spell on You, I feel like I'm rooting for them in a way, just because they're so entertaining and I just love the bombastic camp nature of everything they do. And then I remember that they're trying to kill people and are definitely the villains of the story. I don't think embracing queer-coded villains necessarily means being against well-written characters that provide productive representation. I mean, that's usually the criticism that people have when they talk about these things, right? That these characters had context when they were created, but ultimately they're kind of negative for the community on a whole. I don't disagree with that. I think that Disney can certainly work more on LGBTQ representation and show better support for the community. However, I think there's also something to be said for the phenomenon of reclaiming queer-coded LGBTQ villains that Hocus Pocus does so well. Hell, even Disney recognizes this market to some degree, with merchandise and parties surrounding the villains providing a space for this empathy. I don't know, that charm of make an entrance and that power to stop an audience and make everyone look at you, I think that that's drag power. In the movie, can interpret it because they are witches and they are making spell, but we know that that attention only I think a drag queen can get. As time goes on, it's clear that the legacy of Hocus Pocus is mainly centered around the Sanderson sisters, with Disney even embracing this in their theme parks. Similar to the queer influence on the character of Ursula from The Little Mermaid, Hocus Pocus flips the impact of queer-coded villains on its head, making them empowering characters that become the focus of the movie for many LGBTQ people. The many, many iterations of Sanderson sister costumes by LGBTQ people for the holiday shows that there are plenty of people that resonate with the aesthetic of the movie. The characters give permission to many queer people to explore themselves in ways that feel empowering, not denigrating. Whether the content is just spooky or falls more under horror, there is a unique aspect to Halloween-themed media that allows queerness to seep in in areas it might not otherwise be able to. Though the history behind this is complicated, there is an undeniable modern contingent of LGBTQ people who have claimed that narrative for themselves. Kenny Ortega's Hocus Pocus provides an opportunity for people to experiment with their gender expression without having to necessarily put themselves in an unsafe situation. The inherently absurd nature of Halloween allows people to dress up as whatever they want with little scrutiny, and therefore associated characters often function as escapes for queer people. But make no mistake, despite the absurdity of Halloween, there's nothing absurd or unrealistic about finding your own beauty and being yourself. Happy Halloween, y'all. I put a spell on you Oh, you wretched.